Yeah, if you could pull your Bibles, I really encourage you to bring a physical Bible. You can use your phone, of course. And if you can't afford a physical Bible, I want you to tell us and we'll buy you one. Um, I just really encourage you to bring your physical Bibles. You can mark them up if you want. I don't necessarily like doing that with my Bibles, but it's nice to have just your Bible and you're not, it's not on your phone. I know you guys like your phones and stuff, but um, it's just nice to like have your scripture and nothing else attached to it. So I really encourage you to just bring your physical Bibles if you can. And uh, also, uh, we read from the New American Standard Version when we preach, the 1995. So uh, it's not a very common translation for people to always read, but it is the most literal. So uh, if you have any questions on translation or if you're going to purchase a Bible and you want to ask us that, you can ask me or Josiah or Cindy. They're like very language oriented and very uh, studious on that stuff, I think. <laughs> So, yeah, so we're going to read the God's holy word today, and we're slowly going through John. We're just going to keep going through it until we're done it. I think that's fine. And tonight we're on John 5, 25 to 47. Uh, we're starting to cover a bit more so that we can get through John. And the, ser the series is called Persons. So we're learning about the persons of God, the holy, uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there's a plural on that. Because it's the same God, three different persons, and we're also talking about how God interacts with us and humans and people. Because there's a, there, John is all about establishing God's kingdom on earth and how we react to it and how we organize, how it's organized by Jesus. The first, you can go back on our podcast and our, on our YouTube channel at Enrich Life Regina, and you can listen to our past sermons. I think we missed one or two, but most of them are recorded. And uh, you can listen to what we've been going through with John. And the beginning of John really sets up Jesus as God. That's like the main focus of the last five chapters is this idea that Jesus is undoubtedly God. Jesus is uh, on equal parts with the Father. And, and it continues to do that in John 5 here. So let us continue with that. Uh, starting at verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which, um, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And he will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurre resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will. And remember, this is Jesus talking. So the, the words should be read in your Bible, unless you don't have a red-letter Bible. But the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself... My testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man. But I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works with the, which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, and the, and the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him, who, uh, whom he sent. So he's talking specifically to a crowd. We're going to get into that context. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. 
If another comes in his own name and you will receive him, and you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do you think that I will accuse you before the Father, the one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope? For if you believed Moses, you would believe you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So I want to ask you today, and this page we put up on our blog a week before. So those uh, that are new, basically a week before our faith gathering, we put up the blog, and then you can read it over to prepare yourself for the sermon the next week. And we typically do discussion. We're going to save discussion for the, probably for nearing the end today, um, as I don't want to kind of, I don't want to break it up because there's a bit to go through. But I want you to think about our three questions. Why is testifying about God the Father so important to Jesus? Question number two, Jesus talks about the four witnesses, John, works, Father, Scripture. If we are to follow Jesus' example and be witnesses for God the Father, how can we do that according to what Jesus preaches in this piece of Scripture? And the third question is, you search this, this is what Jesus says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, it is these that testify about me. So John 5, 39. What is Jesus describing here? How can we bring God into our reading of scriptures on our own time? And um, Jesus makes it clear that he is a witness to God the Father. So I want you to think about the word witness or testify or testimony. Those words are very important here. This sermon, I didn't put the title on there, I forgot, but the sermon title is... You, Jesus is a witness, you are a witness. And that's important because this is uh, kind of the thesis of even the first five chapters of John. This is all bottlenecking or it's all culminating into this monologue that Jesus is giving. And the context of this, we read earlier, we actually talked about the healing at Bethesda last faith gathering. And there was people accusing Jesus. There was people getting mad at Jesus for healing the crippled man. There was a crowd that was going after him and questioning him. Um, they specifically said, they asked him, Jesus, who is the man who said to you, or, or sorry, they're asking the man who saved, this man was healed from being crippled and Jesus healed him, not the, not the water at Bethesda. So they're asking the man, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. So there's a crowd gathering. They're starting to become accus accusatory of what Jesus is teaching, which if you've seen protests and crowds, they can get pretty nasty pretty fast. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well, and do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus uh, because he was, not, he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he also was calling God his own father. So he was breaking two like cardinal rules with Judaism there. Healing, working on the Sabbath, and he's saying he is the son of God. He's saying he is the same substance as the father, um, which they would later say is blasphemous. And that's what they would use to put him on the cross. And this monologue I just read to you is his answer to that. So Jesus is doubling down <laughs> on calling himself the same as the Father. And with the language he uses, it's very specific as he begins with the two resurrection uh, a talk. He says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. And then he continues about John, and then he continues about the Father. And this idea of testimony, this idea of witnessing, is very important to, the, to Scripture, to the early church, and to the great commission that God has called us on. What does it mean to be a witness? We often hear this term throughout our lives. It can be a legal term. It usually is a legal term, sorry. Um, we hear it as children and adults. Uh, we hear of witnesses when the crowd see, sees an amazing 
play at their favorite sports sporting events. So sometimes you'll hear, I witnessed this amazing thing, or um, I don't know, who here likes sports? Anyone like sports? Like, what, okay, what's your favorite sport, Dallas? Basketball? What's your favorite team? <laughs> the current bowls are pretty exciting. They're not bad. You don't, okay, you don't like them? <laughs> Uh, so you probably watched The Last Dance, the documentary on Netflix. Did you watch that? Yeah. yeah. Did you enjoy it? Was it pretty amazing to see Michael Jordan do his thing again? And yeah. <laughs> so, so witnessing those events, you know, people that saw, like would flock to arenas to watch Michael play because they wanted to witness an amazing thing. They wanted to see something happen, right? Uh, typically, we also hear witnesses when there's a major trial on play. So when you watch a trial, Typically, a, a witness is a legal term, and it's a very important legal term in a court case. A witness, a bad witness can change, or a good witness can change a whole course of a verdict for a jury and for a judge even making a ruling. So we see this word witness, we see these legal terms, we see it in sports terms as well, we even see it in other terms. Maybe, we, um, maybe witnessing is a bit weird now because we have our phones and we can record stuff, and it's like, look at this, there's a UFO or a witness this, right? But typically when there's a witness, um, typically when what's happening is someone is seeing something happen in front of them that they need to talk about. So it could be something amazing. It could be something legal or illegal. <laughs> it could be, uh, there's many different terms, especially in the Greek use of the word in the Bible. There are different breakdowns of you know, scriptures that use the word in legal terms versus in uh, terms of martyrdom and stuff like that. So, so the, the words in the Greek, uh, so when you look at the word martyr, so martyra, martyria, uh, when you look at testify, martyrio, martyrios, uh, those are different Greek or different um, grammatical uh, usages. And then when you look at the word witness, martus uh, or martus, and then it comes from the word katamartyrio. So that word means to testify against. So katamartyrio is to testify against. And martyria or martyrio is to testify for something. So the word in this specific piece of scripture, so when the word testify is used or the word testimony is used, so it says, you have sent John and he has testified to the truth, but the testimony which I receive is not from man. That is not the catamartyrio usage of the word. That is the martyrio usage of the word or martyrios or martyri. I, in that specific, I don't know grammar that well, <laughs> but it, I wanted you to understand the differences between the two words because that is exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's not calling people to testify against anything. He's calling people to testify for something, someone. So this idea of witnessing is vital all throughout Scripture. And Jesus actually talks about it. He says when he's in... So there's four breakdowns of the witnessing. So if you have your headings in your Bible, it should say something like two resurrections... And then the witness of John, the witness of works, the witness of the Father, and the witness of Scripture. So when we teach the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that's how God has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us as the Father. By the way, it doesn't mean there's a man sitting in heaven. God is a being, and God is everywhere. He's all around us. He's, he's not in stuff. He's just through stuff and all around us, and he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and then he has chosen to reveal himself to us in a parentage way. Uh, Hebrews actually uses language of motherly language uh, as he is a perfect parent figure to us. And then he's revealed himself to us in a specific form as the Son, and that's Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit, and it's not sequential like that. All three are existing at the same time, all together, all the time. They're all eternal, and you see that in the creation narrative in Genesis 1. You see the word ruach in the Hebrew, I know that word, and that just means wind, and it's actually a gender neutral word, which is interesting, and the word in the Greek in the New Testament is pneuma. That's what's used for the Holy Spirit in the Greek, and 
uh, that word ruach is used in Genesis 1 when God is forming, uh, he's forming the dome and forming the water, or the dome above the water, and that's where that word is used. So God didn't just like birth Jesus or create Jesus after that. Um, God didn't just create the spirit after Jesus. Jesus wasn't like on the planet and then he's like, oh my goodness, okay, I need an exit strategy and then I need to make the spirit. No, all three are existing all the time. And we see that when Jesus is baptized in the beginning of Luke, he's baptized in water and the beginning of John points to that. But he's baptized in water and a dove falls down on him and the Holy Spirit falls down on him or works through him and God says, this is my son. And so that's a specific point of reference to the three existing all the time. The way I explain it to kids and to people is God is just choosing to reveal himself to us in different ways. So like I can turn like this, I'm still Jordan, but now you're getting the side of me, right? Or I can turn around and now you're getting the back of me, but I'm still Jordan. I'm just revealing myself to you in a different way. And it's still me, but it's just my back, right? Um, And so... There's, uh, there's teaching out there that teaches that, you know, that the Holy Spirit's a force and that, that all three are not equal in power, and that's just not true. And Jesus is saying that here. So, when it comes to being a witness, and then we're going to leave it for questions, okay? And I want to end with our questions and our discussion. There's a lot I just read, <laughs> but Jesus is talking, he's rebutting an argument. Okay, so people are coming at him, and the book I want to compare this to in the Old Testament, because this isn't, this isn't new, okay? People have been arguing against God since the beginning. That's why God flooded the world in Genesis 6. And we see that continue after God promises not to flood the world through Noah and Noah's ark. We see the, a specific book that really highlights witnessing in the Old Testament is Daniel. And Daniel 3 tells the story of Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego having to bow down before an idol. But they don't bow down. They choose to stand and not worship an idol. They choose to stand for God. And everyone bows down. They stand up. This is a paraphrase, of course. And then they get thrown into the fiery furnace. They don't die because there's a fourth person in the furnace with them. And this witness changes Nebuchadnezzar and his heart, and his mind, a little bit. But they start, it starts working on Nebuchadnezzar, because he witnessed God working through these three, these three standing up for God, being witnesses for God, for God the Father, the monotheistic God, the one true and only God, and God, uh, I, w- I don't want to say bless them, but God came through on his promise to say, if you testify, I want you to testify for me, and I will be with you. And in that moment, he was physically there with them, and he helped them through the furnace, which is a miracle in and itself. So these miracles are actually not a New Testament thing. (laughs) And this idea of witnessing is not just a New Testament thing. And Jesus says this, and he actually says, he actually points to the Jews, and he accuses them. He accuses them of actually doing works in the wrong motivation for the wrong way. He says, but the testimony which I, which I have, so imagine this, they're accusing him, they're standing up in front of him, getting mad at Jesus, calling him a blasphemer for different reasons, and then Jesus is like, okay, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish. So not everyone in that crowd, like John was a crazy guy, because he had so much faith in Jesus that he was baptizing people in water before Jesus uh, like met him. <laughs> and he was testifying about Jesus being the Savior of the world before Jesus died on the cross. But it's not... Eventually, John would get beheaded and die. We're going to get to that in John. But not everyone in the community would have like hated John as much as Jesus. Probably now, at this point, they would have. But... He is saying there's no testimony because John says it. He says, I'm not the light. I'm pointing to the light. He says that at the beginning of John. And Jesus is reiterating that here. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me and the Father has sent me. And so what he's doing there with works 
is he's being very specific with saying, when I do works, it's not for me, it's the Father in me telling me to do them, and it points to the one and only true God. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. So we have the prophecy in Isaiah 9-6, where God lays away through the Davidic line, through the line of David, God lays away for Jesus to come into the world. And we see that even starting in Genesis, when he promises Abraham a nation, right? And we see that line all the way through, all the way through the flood, all the way through, like we see it through all this crazy stuff. We see it through um, even the story of Judges, right? We see the, the people were, were disgraced. The Israelites were so sinful, they abandoned God's covenant. And then they murdered and sexually assaulted a woman and they killed her, and then they cut her body up to remind them of their sin and sent them to the different tribes. And then right after that, God has this redemptive story of Ruth marrying Boaz, and it continues, and it eventually gets to Jesus, which shows that God is both just in allowing us to live in our consequences, and he is full of grace as well, allowing for redemption, even though we have those earthly consequences. So, we have this witness throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you. So he's accusing the Jews, because Jesus is that form. He's that physical form. And they are attacking Jesus. Therefore, they do not believe in Jesus. They don't believe he is God. They don't believe in the prophecy that was given in Isaiah 9 6, they're taking that and they're, they're abandoning Jesus. And that's what he's saying there. I saw a, a cartoon I was going to put up here. I might put it up on social media. It was just a cartoon image of Jesus on the cross and then someone with their cell phone, like walking and looking at their cell phone and like spitting on Jesus and walking away and just like rejecting the cross and rejecting Jesus, right? And it's a very intense image and it's a very like, startling image, but it just goes to show you that this rebellion towards God, it was in Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, and if you actually continue to read Daniel, the people in charge of the government want to come after Daniel because of his faith, so they make a law specific for Daniel so that he, they know that he worships, they know that he goes to the temple, um, they know that he is worshiping the God that they don't want him to worship, and they don't like him either, so they make a law to put him into the lion's den. And what does Daniel do? He continues witnessing by doubling down privately and worshiping on three times a day in his house, even though he can't go to the temple. And even the temple, when Moses builds the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament, when they all work together and God tells them to build the tabernacle, that is a form of witness, building this, this structure to worship God and to show the world that this is a witness for the one true God. So, this is what Jesus accuses them with. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. You are unwilling to come to me as that you may have life. I do not receive glory for men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If... Uh, do not, re yeah. So he's pointing towards their hearts in this last part. And he continues, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So he's actually saying, you are taking the Torah and you're actually not even believing in what you are reading in the Torah. Because if you believed what Moses was doing, if you believed in the ancestors that led to me, you would not be acting this way. You'd be, you would not be indignant towards me. So this is like a very interesting scripture, both just personally, and it's interesting that we're on this, but I want to really challenge you all today as we go into our just quick discussion, but what does, the, what does our witness look like? So we're all here tonight. It's a small group, which is great. We can, we can 
build that relationship. We have people that have come through this ministry as we've been building it. But I want to really just, I want you to think about this. Like, why are you here? Why are we gathering? And I want you to think about the other side of it. You know, I sat around with some pastors from the city and for about 15 minutes, other pastors were lamenting why people aren't coming back to church as much as they thought they would. And they were talking about physically back to church, right? And I know there's many different, diff I mean, we believe in many different ways to do church here. It's in our structure. But we are supposed to gather to build each other up, to hold each other accountable, to make sure we are all in line with the gospel and with scriptures and with Jesus. And just in this city, we have at least 12 pastors sitting around a table asking each other, you know, are your people coming back? Are your people coming back? Why aren't they coming back? And we're discussing all this stuff. I also want to think about just how kind of backwards our world is. It's always going to be backwards until Jesus comes back. But I think at times it might feel a bit more an anxious right now. It might feel a bit more unknown right now. And I want to ask ourselves, like, why do we think this is important? And is witnessing for Jesus important? And if it is, what does that look like? Because Jesus is saying here, he's accusing these men, these Jews, of being poor witnesses, of not believing in him, of abandoning his covenant. And he is revering John and holding John up for testifying of the gospel even before the gospel has happened. <laughs> I mean, the gospel is happening. <laughs> and I really want to challenge ourselves with this idea of have we become complacent in North America with our witness? Are we actually doing a good job building up witnesses in our churches? Here. Are we doing a good job of having those relationships to hold each other accountable to what the gospel is? And Jesus says that the gospel is here it's very clear that he will go to the cross, that he is God, that he will die in our place so that we don't die. Because uh, when we die, because of our original sin found in Genesis, we deserve to go to hell. We all are going to die in this room. Some of us are going to live longer than others. We all have a death sentence. And we all have a time to witness for Jesus. And all we need to do to access that eternal life with God in heaven is to have faith in Christ alone. Because he died on the cross for our sins in our place, and then he resurrected from the grave three days later, defeated death, proclaiming the gospel, the good news, that we can access that grace by faith alone, not by our works. And once we are saved, then Jesus calls us to live righteously. He calls us to live in accordance to his word. And that's what Paul writes about quite often in the New Testament. And Jesus says that will make you a witness. He's talking about John being a witness here. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. And then, he, and then he's, they're turning on Jesus. So they're like, you like John for a bit? <laughs> but now they're going to turn on John, by the way, because Jesus is now a blasphemer. And then they're going to go after John and kill him. And John is going to stand firm in his witness. And the word in the Greek, materios, martyrios, the word martyr is in there. To die for one's faith, for one's belief. And I, I just want us to think about that and let it resonate. What is the fruit in your life that bears witness of the gospel to others? What do your actions look like? And what does your proclaiming look like? Because actions are important. 
and they matter. And I think in our current church situation, we probably don't do actions maybe enough at times, but works alone are not the gospel. You have to proclaim the truth and know the truth and know what the gospel is and bear that witness. And it's a legal term. It's not a legal term here, but we use it mostly as a legal term in evidence of an event. (laughs) I saw Michael Jordan do some amazing stuff. I saw him hit that jumper and push off Russell and Byron Russell. I saw him win the game in the playoffs when everyone was old and it was 98 playoffs and they won, right? I saw that. It's on TV, it's recorded, therefore it happened, and it's true. And as Christians living today, we actually don't have that excuse to say we don't, we didn't see things, we didn't, because we have the scriptures in front of us. We have the witnesses recorded down throughout history in one complete book that God has given to us as a revelation of his works and himself. So this ministry and this vision, we want to raise up witnesses to reach the lost. Not just create a space for other church people to come to. That's great. And we're going to build up the saints. We're going to equip. The reason I believe this is important that we're doing tonight is because it's life or death. It's heaven. It's hell. And there's a world out there that has no good news at all. Because even if you put your good news and your faith in a political party, you might be winning for four years, and then you might hate your life for the next four, right? Kingdoms come and go. So I want us just to chew on that for a bit, for a minute. Um, So why is testifying? So what does, let's do the last one. Or let's, there's a question at the very end. So how can we make sure that we are being true witnesses of Jesus? And we've established tonight that witnessing is, throughout the entirety of Scripture, it's something that has been vital to a person's faith throughout the entirety of Scripture. And God wants people to stand up for him and to testify for him and to testify on his behalf and to proclaim the truth to others so that they can come to know him. But how can we make sure that we are being true witnesses of Jesus? And not out of ourselves, not of our politics, not of our personal values even. And that can be hard because sometimes our personal values do come from Scripture. They should, right? But those aren't the gospel, right? Those aren't the good news of of the faith in Christ alone, right? So how do we make sure What are some things that we can be doing in our lives to make sure we are bearing good witness? There's some other questions on there, like why is testifying about God the Father so important to Jesus? Yeah. It was their structure. It was the way their community was built. Yeah. Their, their laws were governed yeah, yeah. by the so Torah. If you yeah. Break the law in Canada. Yeah. You go to prison. If you break the law in the Torah, you can be put to death. There are various um, consequences to breaking the law. And actually, even within the Twelve Commandments, we get the commandment not to bear false witness. Yeah. And because witness is very, very important to the society, the whole societal stability is based on having at least two or three witnesses. Um, in Deuteronomy, it says that wherever they're on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And um, 
is saying that the, the witness of one person isn't enough. Um, so I think the importance here is that Jesus is speaking to them in their context. They understand the importance of witness and the law is not to their false witness. Mm -hmm. And so he's using that to underline the importance of who he's speaking about when he's speaking about God. Um, and that the, the writings which they were looking at also, the writings themselves testify to him. Yep. Um, being the son of, of man and the son of God. It's interesting too because when you look at, I love that poll from Deuteronomy because when you look at Matthew 18.20, it says, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So it's that same idea of building up that community around God to bear witness to what God is doing and to like solidify it almost in a way. Not that God needs that, but uh, it, it gives that legal precedence of establishing it within that land, within that place. Um, why do you think that's important? Does anyone want to... Do, do you think that's... I mean, we, we have just done that. <laughs> like, do you think that's important? Do you think it's important to um, do a secular thing like that as a community? Do you still think that's important? Because uh, biblically, it's talking about that, right? It's using that terminology to two or three, right? Not just one. False doctrine. Yeah. Well, even in verse 31, he says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Yeah. You know, so Jesus is saying, like, no, this whole thing is setting him up to show all the witnesses to who he really is. Yeah. Right? And so, so first he says, you know, the Father testifies. And then he says, John testifies. And then my works, the miracles testify, and the Father testifies, and the scriptures testify. So he's he's laying it out. And I think I think for us too, it's it's like um, people bear witness to us, like other Christians will bear witness to how we're living our life or what we're doing. And, that's so much the importance of community yeah. because we should be being held accountable if we're following Jesus and, and we should have those witnesses, you know, and the scripture should bear witness to our lives as well, not in the same way prophetically like it did Jesus, but that we're living according to the scripture and by, by the word of God that we profess. Yeah. And so all those things in our life, like we should, we should be able to, you know, have the witness of our pastor and our faith community. We should be able to have the witness of our works yeah. as well. That's part of the witness. When people see something different in you because of Jesus, that's the witness of works. And, and I think that's the key. I think that's, I think Jesus is laying out the four pillars. And because the modern, I mean, Christians have done it for ages, but we have gotten away from 
some right teaching in the church. We've gotten away from people latching on to gospel that is a feel-good message, right? And that has happened in our society uh, largely because people are not being good witnesses of the scripture. They're not going to the scripture for discernment or they don't have that community, like you said, to testify and rebuke them when they need to and to sharpen them in that way, right? Uh, and that's why I like how Jesus lays it out in the four ways because it's, they're all important, but they all need to be about the monotheistic God. And that's why John's testimony is revered because he's not just doing this on a whim, he's doing it because God is gonna save the world as Jesus um, died on the cross, and that, that's why Jesus is commending him, right? And I think that's why he's also accusing the Jews, because they've gotten to a point, like you said, Josiah, with the legality of their structure of society. Like, a lot of these consequences for this sin, a lot of it is death, like, or losing a limb. Like, very consequential stuff. Like, that's why Jesus dies, right? And so the witnessing is very important in that culture because of that. And these men have taken the, the Sabbath, we learned earlier, and they've kind of taken it and s screwed it up, screwed around with it, changed it to benefit them instead of a way to worship God. And that's why Jesus heals on the Sabbath. So, yeah, I like what you said there, Cindy, and it, it's so important to go back to Jesus. And I taught at camp this year, where can we read about Jesus? And it's the Bible. We don't really have an excuse. And that's what I was getting at at the end. And that's what I want to convict everyone with tonight as we end. We need to stop making excuses to sharpen ourselves in these four areas. And yes, you can go out next week do service and feel really good. And it's good to feel good doing service. It's in us to do that. God created us to be generous. But we do it here to worship Jesus. And we do it to bear witness to others on behalf of Jesus <laughs> so that they can know what Jesus' light looks like. That's why we do it. We don't do it for ourselves. Our, the byproduct of doing that of, is being happy because we did that, right? And so that's what I want you to kind of write down maybe or think about after tonight. Look at the areas of your life. Look at your Bible reading. Look at your study. Look at your prayer life. Look at your personal relationship and alone time with Jesus. I am sick of the world abandoning Jesus. I'm actually sick of the church. I'm tired of hearing, hearing busyness. I try not to say that anymore either. Because if you're too busy to pour into a relationship, that relationship will sour. Whether it's a friendship, a marriage, a mentorship. If you start ignoring that person, I don't know, has that ever happened to anyone? Where someone started ignoring you? Did it feel nice? Did it make you want to go back to that person afterwards? And maybe God has given you that grace to be able to do that. Um, man, we treat God like that so often. And then we expect him to do stuff for us. Treat him like a vending machine. Just like the Jews kind of did a little bit at times. When they weren't accusing him. And, and that happens even after Jesus' testimony, after he's gone and the Holy Spirit's still with people. Paul talks about that quite a bit throughout the New Testament. It's just something we always struggle with. But you're all here tonight. <laughs> you think this is important to gather, to pour into God's word.
had a body up. Yeah. Died. So I think there, there definitely is a part where the, the church does need to be in communion with each other, living yep. in each other's lives, keeping each other accountable, and also setting examples for each other. Yep. Amen. Anyone from this side want to chime in? Questions? Don't agree? It's fine if you don't. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the vertical part is we, you hear that in very charismatic. Sort of, I love it. You hear it charismatically a lot of the time where it's just like, like this is vertical. This is vertical. Not just your worship music. Like you should be using this to make sure your worship music is good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not the other way around. And I'm kind of being a bit old man-ish, Right? But, oh, I don't connect to it. I have a hard... Well, God wants us to use our brains. He made our brain. And when you dive into his word, that's a vertical action, right? As with your prayer life and your meditative life. And I really want to challenge you. Take an hour out of your day and make that a God time every day. At least an hour. And it'll fill you up. I know when I have hard days and I make mistakes and I slip up, that's like the first thing I do. It's like I go to my basement and I just like, <laughs> usually I'm repenting. <laughs> and I open up Old Testament stuff or Ecclesiastes and I'm like, this is meaningless, whatever. Because God is the meaningful one, right? And, um, and people still die for him. You know, I think we need to be challenged in North America that we need to be careful what we take in as Christians because uh, there's a lot of stuff that can pull us away. That might not be death, but it could be spiritual death. It could be heretical doctrine. It could, you know, and that's why that vertical part, like you said, Dallas, I love that. And the Bible's vertical. Sometimes charismatic, sometimes forget that. <laughs> and we are charismatic. That's why I say that. So we're Pentecostal. <laughs> um, anyone else? I love that. Yeah, that's great. And it goes in with what you said, with influence. How can you witness for Jesus if you don't know him and what he said? And then he still says stuff to us, right? He's still working, right? He's still working. Uh, don't, you know, there, yeah, he's still working, still doing stuff, but how can you discern that to make sure it's God? Go back to scripture and make sure it's God. Or ask a friend. <laughs> or your pastor, or whoever's in your life, that you can be like, I don't know if this is just me or God, or if it's both. Are we okay to wrap up? It's a bit long, but awesome. Um, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this night. Thank you that we could pour into your word. Uh, thank you so much that you have given us the freedom to do this in our country. Pray that we won't take that for granted. And I just pray that as we continue moving forward that we will just be witnesses for you. That in our times of coffee with people, in our times of playing video games with people, watching movies, hanging out, being stressed about next semester or whatever, in those times, I pray that we will always think vertically in essence of our relationship with you. Whether it's a scripture you're pulling up in our mind, whether it's a prayer that we need to say, and Lord, I pray that we will live balanced lives as Christians. 
that we won't just be about the relationship, emotional, connecting the worship side of things, but that will, uh, or that we won't be um, on the other side of legalistic with just rigidness with scripture or whatever, or bringing politics into that. I pray that we'll be a good, balanced fruit bearers of both. And Lord, I pray that we will discern our lives with your scripture and as a community together. And I just want to say thank you for giving me this community, for our board at Enrich, for sharpening me this year, for holding me accountable, and for not being afraid to do that. And I just pray that that will continue in this ministry. And that when someone does that with us, even if it's in the wrong, I pray that we won't take offense, that we will be grace-filled, that we will examine ourselves as we respond. And I pray that we will operate in truth and in grace as we go on campus, go into our workplaces, wherever we go. And I pray that we will, when the time is right and the moment comes, that we won't cower, that we will stand up, that we'll be the, 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 the Bendigos, the Meshach, Radshaks, that we'll be the Daniels, that we'll be just like John, a little bit crazy, <laughs> but on fire for you. And I pray that we won't do that on our own, but we'll do that in your power. So we give this night to you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome.